So this presentation is called Curatorial Reflections, but in fact that's a bit of a cheat on my part. I should say at the outset that I did co-write the funding bid with John, but that bid didn't include a curator, and perhaps if we were doing it now we would put one in. So I became honorary curator on the project, and that was really just because I got really interested in what was happening in the project. I should say I've worked as a curator and manager for the Science Museum for several decades and it was my curatorial experience that I brought to the project. So uh, in these few minutes I've divided into three unequal sections. I'll start by talking about why I was keen to submit the Heritage Connector bid in the first place. Then I'll talk about some of what we learnt about the relations between digital and the curatorial during the project and then I'll finish up with just a few reflections on how we're going to apply what we learnt uh, in the new Congruence Engine project which is just starting. So I was very keen on this idea when uh, Jamie and John came to me with it. Um, I'm head of research um, so people do come to me with ideas for research projects and the reasons are both strategic um, and also to do with my own personal history here. Um, so in terms of strategy, uh, the Science Museum's research strategy, uh, there we state as a core aim to get funding to support with research the things that the museums already want to do. Um, and John's project was a, was, was a case in point. Um, the extra money that came from the Arts and Humanities Research Council allowed the investigation of a, of a field that um, they kind of knew was interesting. Um, uh, and for me, uh, most of the research we funded is, it, is much more conventional sort of history of technology stuff. So very keen to branch out into other areas of the museum's activity, including learning and conservation, and in this case, digital. And John's digital strategy for the Science Museum Group, uh, in a nutshell, is all about harnessing the power of digital. And I think this project has moved us a little bit further along the route of harnessing that power. But from my own, from my own point of view, um, I mean, ever since I was a working curator, I felt that, you know, we curators have a real privileged position in relation to these collections that are held on, on behalf of the nation. Um, a lot of people who come into the front door of the Science Museum think that what we've got on to show what we've got on show is all there is, whereas in actual fact we display only about three percent of the total collection. The rest is it of it is in vast buildings in other parts of the country. Um, and so as a curator with this sort of uh, opportunity to inhabit the whole collection, um, I have a sort of urge, you know, to share that with other people who would be really into what's in the collection, if only they knew it existed. And there's a bit of a question about, there's so much um, tacit knowledge about being a curator. I mean, to what extent will people uh, have to become curators in order to be able to enjoy those collections? I mean, that's not a question I'm going to answer this afternoon, but it's the sort of uh, background question which will be in place with the new project. So, turning to my second section, I mean, my real eureka moment, I think, um, came um, uh, at the, about the beginning of this year, uh, and it resulted in the blog, which has already been uh, alluded to, which um, uh, Kalyan and I wrote together. And it's really about... Um, um, if you like, the difference in the sort of expectations and attitudes to the data that represent our collections. Um, so, if you look on the left-hand side of this screen, this is a this is an inventory description that I pulled down from Collections Online yesterday. You can see it's quite brief, uh, and it's pretty incomprehensible, and it's only you know it's only got about a dozen words in it. Um, and you might ask. Why does the Science Museum have such a rubbish inventory description? And actually, if you look on Collections Online, you'll find quite a lot of the descriptions of the objects are very brief. And this is where the, cu the curator's sense of history comes in. Because 
I happen to know as a curator that the date the core data that is in our database which is sucked through to collections online originates in the sort of document you can see on the right hand side here this is called a form 100 every assistant curator had a little cabinet of these uh, in in their office and these are basic audit or stock taking records so for every object in the collect in every collection there was one of these cards uh, and this basically allowed the assistant curator to find uh, the the object if it was needed for a display or to be photographed or for an inquiry and you can see you know, there's an inventory number there's a description and it says where it comes from and when it came in you might even find out that it had a lantern slide. Um, so that's when it came to making the computer database, basically we employed data processors and they typed out all these cards. I mean, tens of thousands of them were typed out. And that's the origin of most of the database. Is this all the museum knows about a particular object or set of objects? I'm using this example throughout this collection of Marconi Company things. Well, no, of course not, because, of course, the curator carries in her or his head a lot of contextual and a lot of connective understanding of, of these collections. And for our older collections, uh, the collections in the physical sciences and engineering and transport, uh, they got round to publishing quite detailed catalogues about uh, about these uh, about these collections. And so here's the 1925 uh, uh, collection uh, catalog of the uh, electrical communication collection, and you can see that actually there's rather more extensive information uh, in the printed catalog. Uh, the curator um, has gone away and. Um, Roderick Denman he was called and he's written this more extensive catalogue description now it's probably only about three times the length of the one you saw on the card uh, and that's probably the tip of the iceberg of what he actually knew but actually those data exist I knew that as a curator but uh, it wasn't necessarily evident to the people who run the collections database and why should it be it's part of the sort of the broader culture and understanding that the museum carries at any one time in many cases if you look at these catalogues the data on individual objects are much more detailed you'll get half a page on an object rather than just a dozen words Well, I'm glad to say that you know there are occasions on which the museum is able to produce much richer data, and those tend to be where extra money comes in. Um, so, for example, uh, this is one of the objects under that previous uh, description I sh showed you on the Form 100 card. And so when we were producing the um, uh, Information Age Gallery, the then curator, John Liffin, was able to do a lot of work on the on, on on this object and so there's a really detailed description here and from what you heard Jamie and Kalyan talking about earlier you can appreciate that the the extra terms and dates and names and places that are in these more detailed descriptions um, can enable you to do a lot more connective work so what I would say is it took working together on Heritage Connect to, to re reveal this that curators and digital people don't necessarily know what the other people know and that digital ways of thinking about the collections differ from curatorial understandings so from the curatorial point of view the universe they inhabit is the physical collection that they care for whereas on the digital side a lot of the time the universe is the best data they can get their hands on for them the data are weak and inconsistent for the curator, the data have a history and can be explained. For the curator, there is a literature that enables deeper context and understanding. For the digital people, there's a tendency, I think, to, to look for uh, enriching data sources online. And there are virtues in both these approaches. So within Heritage Connector, this realisation provided the context 
um, for us to understand together what was happening in the linked open data approach. But I began to think that linked open data is a good metaphor for how curators think already that objects are linked by many associations of named individuals or companies. They're connected to places and personalities of use. They're linked to geographical location and historical period or historical discipline. And then again, that relevant uh, published literature that they may know about. And so the visualizations that Kalyan and the others at COGAP have produced look like a sort of figurative map of how curators mentally inhabit their collections. And that's open pathways for what we're going to do in the next project. So these ongoing discussions uh, encourage me to think that we really need to put dialogue between the digital and the curatorial and the historical at the heart of co Congruence Engine. We're going to build Jane's Bridge right across the middle of Congruence Engine and make sure that we're going backwards and forwards across it a lot of the time. What is Congruence Engine? Well, it's a three million pound project that will run for three years looking at industrial history. It's going to create a real-world demonstration of what it will be like when it's possible to work across the UK's collections unencumbered by the current institutional silos. In this age of Google, you might think that you could just uh, uh, punch in museum mining industry into Google and get all the data from all the different heritage organisations which hold relevant things. It's just not the case. If you want to find out about the mining industry, the coal mining industry, and how it's represented in the nation's collections, you'd have to go separately to the Discovery Museum in Newcastle, the Science Museum collection, the National Coal Mining Museum, National Museum, National Museums Wales. If you wanted to find out about the films, you'd have to go to the BFI and the BBC. If you wanted to find out about photographs, you'd have to go to lots of different repositories. So what we're going to experiment with co in Congruence Engine is bringing together those different data sets. And then we're going to bring together curators and historians, both people who earn their living by, doing the, uh, by collecting and, and doing history, and those who just do it for fun. And we're going to have them doing mini research projects uh, on the basis that you can bring those different collections together. And we're going to do that around three industrial sectors of textiles, energy and communications. And we're going to use all sorts of different digital humanities tools and different kinds of AI technique, including those a trialed in Heritage Connector, to support these historical investigations of our industrial past. And the idea is that well, the digital and the curatorial and the historical working together will, link, will lead to a honing of digital tools and a better understanding of how we can bring these things about. So in short, um, Congruence Engine will recognise the potential mutual benefit uh, of the digital and the curatorial working together. We will recognise and exemplify that enhancing and, and increasing collections online needs both digital and curatorial or historical expertise. And f you know, for the part of me that is uh, still a historian, I think it will enable new sorts of history, bringing together these different elements and enabling types of history to be written which are perhaps more like a museum display bringing together the object and the archive and the film and the illustration. That's a little bit of information uh, about the Congruence Engine. Uh, in the recording you'll be able to stop on this frame and see some of the people who are involved. Sufficient to say there are uh, 12 co-investigators, 5 collaborating organisations and 15 named partners. So it's a big thing. That's what we're going to be doing, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we have got time if anyone has got a, a, a last question that they'd like to put into uh, the Q&A. But I was really struck, Tim, and would like to you talk a little bit more about this idea of linked open data as a metaphor for the way curators think, because so often 
artificial intelligence is used as an alternative to human knowledge and input, that we can do this more quickly and we don't need to have people do it and we can get them involved at a stage, perhaps, that you're talking about them really working in parallel and informing each other and reflecting each other. And it will be really interesting to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Well, I've been stimulated by Heritage Connector to to think quite hard about um, um, and as I was writing the the bid for congruence engine, thinking about um, uh, about the um, about how museum ways of knowing are not only quite you know or if you like curatorial ways of knowing are not only different f uh, from digital and collections and management ways of thinking. Um, but they're also quite different from academic history. And the more I've thought about um, what uh, the curator Nick Thomas calls museum as method, which is a recognition of styles of research which are particular to, um, to museums. I mean, he talks about, um, he, he talks about the importance of juxtaposition as a tool of curatorial practice. He talks about the discovery of the object in, in, in the store, finding something new. He talks about the labor, the intellectual labor of creating labels and texts which describe the physical world. So there are types of activity um, in museums, but I think they all tend to cluster around displays. And I, as I you know, the, the whole philosophy of display is that you bring things together into a space and invite people to take them in at a glance. And what you're doing is you're producing a sort of associative account. You're saying these things belong together. And it may be a lovely indexical thing like you have a steam hammer in front of you and you can see a contemporary etching of a steam hammer from the 1830s or something. But that's associative knowledge. It's rather different from, if you like, the the way that academic history often works by you know, constructing an argument and deploying uh, evidence, which is often textual only in, in origin. Um, so it was looking at looking at those. Um, I mean, if you think about that, the um, the last demo from Tristan of of the knowledge graph renders as a, as as the opening credits for Star Trek, but th that idea that things group together and they belong together, you know, if a curator is showing an X-ray set in an exhibition, as I've done, um, then you're kind of thinking, which of the X-ray sets in my collection are particularly resonant for this display? So there's already a sort of sense of a cluster, and then who made that x-ray set and when did they live and who did they know so curatorial thought i think is rather like that linked open data thing you know so everything you know is kind of linked off to three other things which are relevant and that's the sense in which i've begun to think of this sort of associative mode and just one final quick question from me, which might be a bit unfair to end on, but as coming new to these digital conversations, what did you find the most difficult thing? Um, that what was the, the challenge to bridging across into those discussions? It's a very good question. Um, I think it's unfamiliarity um, because in my time I've been quite techy, you know, I, you know, I have done a little bit of computer programming. I, you know, I, 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 I can solder, solder up a radio circuit. You know, I'm, I'm not entirely useless in technical things. But I found that um, it's very abstract, um, the language of programming. Um, and I think, um, you know, amongst the co-investigators in Congruence Engine, I'm not the only historian who wants to roll up his sleeves and get his hands dirty trying the programming because I think um, that practical mode of actually trying things out is how you really learn and you know f for Heritage Connector I haven't had the time to develop any skills to allow me to do very much at all um, and I think you know I, I do hope that you know that, 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 that there will be some mingling between the, if you like the two sides so that we learn a little bit more and try out a little bit more of each other's ways of thinking mm -hmm. and I think that's the way that we'll uh, get the necessary 
uh, joined up conversation that we'll need for the next generation of the digital in museums. Great, thank you very much, Tim. Thanks. And I'll hand back to John now to close the event. Great, thank you, uh, Tim and Jane. Yep, so it's only just now for me to wrap up. We're a couple of minutes over, so it seems like that's pretty good going. So just a, a few thanks to, to obviously everyone who spoke today, uh, to the wider project team, because there was a few others who didn't speak, but thanks to them as well, because obviously they've contributed hugely over the last couple of years, to uh, Tristan and, and everyone at COGAP for hosting us and making us feel welcome and uh, giving us a really great day of, of conversations and exploration in Brighton. Uh, and thanks to Rebecca and uh, Colin from the Towards the National Collection Programme at the AHRC, um, who've been supporting getting the word out about our hackathons and reposting our blogs and, and supporting us throughout. Um, and then to uh, Samina and Rhiannon for organising the uh, webinar today. So there's a few more bits and pieces for the project continues to the end of the calendar year. So there's a few more blog posts in the works. So keep an eye out for them. There's will be a final report which will be published early in 2022, which includes um, uh, again an overview, but also recommendations from the project into the wider towards national collection program. Um, and so with that. I'll say thank you all for spending your Friday afternoon with us and have a great weekend.